everyone. I'm going to ask you to take your seats, please. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone. It is my absolute honor and my distinct pleasure to introduce today's Innovations in Tobacco Control speaker, Dr. Jonathan Samet. My name is Joanna Cohen, and I'm the current director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I want to welcome all of our in-room attendees as well as our Zoom attendees. I was told that we have people registered from over 50 countries joining online. Now, our renowned guest, Dr. Jonathan Samet, founded the Institute for Global Tobacco Control 25 years ago in 1998. And we are so very pleased to have him back at Hopkins to celebrate the Institute's 25th year anniversary. Uh, Dr. Samet is a true giant in the field, but I'm gonna keep this introduction short so we have enough time to hear from him. But most importantly, from my perspective, Beyond founding the Institute for Global Tobacco Control, uh, Dr. Samet was chair of the Department of Epidemiology here um, from, for 14 years, from 1994 to 2008. Uh, he then left Hopkins to chair the Department of Preventive Medicine at the University of Southern California. And then in 2017, he was selected to be dean at the Colorado School of Public Health. He just recently stepped down from that role, but he continues as a professor of epidemiology and environmental and occupational health. As a pulmonary physician and epidemiologist, Dr. Samet's research has focused on the health risks of pollutants in indoor and outdoor air and of active and passive smoking. Now, he has served on and chaired numerous committees of the National Academies of Sciences, Medicine, and Engineering, uh, was chair of the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee at EPA, and chair of the FDA's Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee. Also, Dr. Samet has served as editor and author for reports of the Surgeon General on smoking and health since 1984 including serving as the senior scientific editor for the 2014 50th anniversary report. I mean, this is a tremendous report and an unparalleled resource. I have a copy here. This is, this is just the supplemental tables, okay? I could, I could not carry the full report. Um, I'll say that Dr. Samet received the Surgeon General's medallion in 1990 and in 2006 for these contributions, and he has received many other prestigious awards and recognition for his outstanding research, service, and his impact, including the Luther Terry Award for a Distinguished Career from the American Cancer Society. Now, due to the large audience turnout today, we apologize in advance that we won't be able to um, get to every question. For our in-person attendees, please raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. And for our Zoom attendees, please put your question in the chat, the Q&A, sorry, the Q&A, and we will be monitoring that. So I am so thrilled that Dr. Jonathan Samet and his wife have come home to Baltimore. This is such a treat and I'm so excited to hear what you're gonna share with us today. So welcome, John. Well, thanks, uh, Joanna. It's always nice to come back to Hopkins and to uh, Baltimore. Some things change and some don't. Like, will construction ever end on Monument Street? Uh, so uh, it's a great honor to come back and give this uh, talk in honor of the 25th uh, anniversary of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you some early history since I think I probably know it best. Uh, remember it or somebody write it down so we don't lose the early days of the Institute. And then I have this bold title about looking back and looking forward. I guarantee you, it's much easier to look back than to look forward. But I will say some things about um, where I think the global tobacco epidemic may go. So let's turn to the early years. So I came here in 1994 to be chair of the Department of Epidemiology. 
I had been at the University of New Mexico for 16 years, uh, where I had a job as a pulmonary doc and had developed a uh, research program on what Joanna talked about, things that get into the lung, that damage the lung. And leading the list, of course, was tobacco smoke. And we began a portfolio of work on active and passive smoking. And uh, I ended up, because of that work, involved with the Surgeon General's report and the application of all the evidence we were generating to try and do something. And the Surgeon General's reports were an important vehicle for translation. I came to Hopkins and uh, I was contacted after my first year by Carl Taylor. Carl was the founding chair of the Department of International Health. He had been in China as a UNICEF representative. And at that point in the mid 1990s, China was gonna host the 1997 World Conference and wanted to showcase the work they were doing on tobacco, which was not much. And Carl said, go to China and see what you can do. So I did what Carl told me, went to China, and uh, actually met with his friends, who included the Minister of Health at the time, Cheng Ming Zan. And I met Yang Gong Wang, who was essentially the sole person doing tobacco control in China at the time, probably with a budget of about $20,000 US annually. The, um, we talked. And they wanted to do a national survey of smoking, but had no funds. And I came back and Carl and I found some funds to get things going for this national survey, which was eventually uh, completed. And also to help China with uh, support for the 10th World Conference. Uh, Gung Wang went on to be a very important figure, not only in tobacco control, but in chronic disease prevention. And when China CDC was created, she was a deputy a director in charge of surveillance and uh, chronic disease control and remains a friend. I'll point out to Judith Mackay from Hong Kong, who was a central figure in tobacco control in Asia, still active, still engaged with the Bloomberg um, initiative. But moving on to some of the uh, early team uh, members, uh, as this came together, I first want to highlight Sally O'Brien, who I think is not here, but Sally worked in development. And when I came back from China, we began to seek funding. I reached out to everybody I knew, the American Cancer Society, NCI, and so on, and said, there's an issue in China, a big tobacco control problem. And we could not find much support. One of our initial supporters was Smith Klein Beecham, uh, engaged by Sally that helped provide support for the uh, 1996 survey. Uh, other figures, uh, some of whom are in the room, there's uh, Ben Appleberg, who was, got his PhD and went on to work. Raise your hand, Ben. Don't hide. And uh, Steve uh, Tamplin, who is the master of orchestrating training workshops, and Pat Bricey, who uh, worked with us on the Secondhand Smoke, uh, Erica Tang, my colleague and friend Heather Whipfley, who was at WHO, finished her PhD, was with the Institute, and then moved to uh, USC and very active in Sub Saharan Africa. Fran Stillman, uh, Marion Sarasso, who was one of the first to uh, work at the uh, Institute as a member of our team. Uh, and this is us together in Providence uh, quite recently. And then there, was, there were many other people who were involved and many who have stuck with uh, tobacco control. So that's been really one gratifying aspect of the Institute. It's proved to be a training ground for people who have the passion and the fortitude to work in global tobacco control. So in the early, early years, we had a mix of uh, funding uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation to work in Southeast Asia, Atlantic Philanthropies, the Fogarty International Center, a key grant that uh, helped develop some of the lasting connections for the Institute. FAMRI, the Flight Attendance Medical Research uh, Institute, and then of course, uh, Bloomberg uh, Philanthropies. You've all heard of Bloomberg? Uh, so the Fogarty grant uh, 
supported training, training workshops, and established uh, three country centers, Mexico with the National Institute for Public Health, Brazil with the National Cancer Institute, and then uh, China with the China CDC and Peking Union Medical Center. And at the time, a lot of work on secondhand smoke exposure, policy formulation, and uh, more. This work in China uh, was intense. We did multiple surveys. And by 2000, we had done enough surveys that we thought it was time to talk about action. And that's where we worked with Steve Tamplin, who was then at uh, the Western Pacific Regional Office of uh, WHO, and put together this uh, workshop on national policy. One lesson that I learned from this was you can produce reports and they're just that. And uh, we uh, did not see much follow-up action from uh, this report. And I think it was a lesson in uh, the complexities of tobacco control in any country. And then the particular issues of China with the state monopoly, China National Tobacco, as the principal manufacturer of cigarettes. The work in uh, China continued with uh, other uh, activities, a lot of work, as I mentioned, on secondhand smoke and two cycles of funding for this set of projects. I'm particularly proud of the work on secondhand smoke that Pat and others were uh, in, uh, involved with. Uh, some of the uh, key, uh, key papers, Ana Navas led this effort to measure nicotine levels in capital cities across Latin America. The paper was actually cited when Uruguay, the first nation to go smoke-free in the Americas, did so. Uh, the 31 country study uh, funded by FAMRI that uh, Heather uh, took the lead on. The workshop, here's the WHO policy document on secondhand smoke coming out of a workshop in uh, Uruguay that was organized by the Institute in partnership with uh, PAHO. So again, I think uh, this model of science and policy is one that is clearly stuck with the uh, Institute. Bloomberg, uh, of course, the start of the Bloomberg Initiative. This was a launching press conference in 2008. We had a group of uh, trainees, participants in a work leadership workshop here. We went to New York and uh, they were just amazed by seeing Bloomberg and Gates Together, the cell phones were going off with pictures. They were all out texting uh, back to uh, their home countries. And this is a uh, meeting of the Bloomberg partners at their current uh, headquarters as it was under uh, construction. So, uh, and now the next uh, chapter, here's Joanna and I. This is 2014 uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, the mission uh, continued. Uh, to do important things, uh, remaining around capacity building, evaluation and surveillance, generating knowledge, but always with an eye towards doing something with what has been uh, generated. And innumerable workshops and partnerships uh, continue with Mexico and other uh, institutions. So that's the early history. I so hope somebody wrote it down. Uh, and uh, you can have these uh, slides. I want to talk about now why there's a tobacco pandemic. And it took me a while to figure this out. I went back to Epi 1 for that. Everybody remembers the epidemiological triangle? Okay, vector, host, et cetera. It actually turns out to be useful. So for years I've been showing this. And then finally I started to understand it uh, more recently, I started to give talks about the parallels between COVID and the tobacco industry. And what is unique here is that the tobacco industry has control of the agent and the environment and influences those who are at risk. And I, I think that's why, in my mind, this epidemic started, continues, and is hard to stop. So the agent, the modern cigarette, is intended to addict, no doubt. Jeff Wigand was one of the insiders who, whistleblower, 
topic of a, a movie a long time ago, but the cigarettes engineered to deliver nicotine in a palatable form. Who's taken a puff of a cigarette? Boy, that's pretty good news. You know, I, I took a puff of a cigarette. I was like 13. And my older sister smoked. And she smoked the minute she got in the car and was out of sight of my parents. And I said, she got in the car, she lit her cigarette, out of sight. And I took it and I said, give me a puff. And I inhaled. And I felt sick. I coughed. And I never did that. Again, why? Because nicotine is incredibly irritating. And who would stick their mouth on the tailpipe of a car and inhale, which is roughly the same. So we have all these reflexes. So the cigarette's engineered so that you can get that puff. Why is there a little bit of menthol in all tobacco products? It's an anesthetic, right? Cools, deals with the irritating, the receptors. So and nicotine itself is irritating. So we have an engineered agent and it's one that the industry has modified, modified, modified over time to continue its success as an addicting product. And these are just some of the events. And if you look backwards, menthol cigarettes coming along, so-called low-yield cigarettes that were part of the campaign of fraud, misleading the public, that these were somehow safer. Of course, we're now in the vaping era and also the heat not burn error. So there's been ever consistent changes in the environment, in the agent. Also control of the environment, advertising, movies. Uh, typical, here's Ronald Reagan, our former president, uh, pushing Chesterfields, marketing to women, making them think that this was a good thing to do, that it helped be slim to smoke. Movies. Uh, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, for those of you who know, uh, that's DiCaprio, uh, who's gone from intensive smoking of cigarettes to vaping. Uh, the Kent Micronite filter, the idea was safer. Does anybody know what the Kent Micronite filter was made of, the original? Pat does. What was it, Pat? Asbestos, crecidolite asbestos, the worst kind. Okay, so the original filters were made of asbestos. And then the Camel, the first mass-marketed cigarette. And if you were to look at the pack, you'd find that it was so good that no premiums were provided. Marketing, where was Camel made? North Carolina. No pyramids, no camels, et cetera. So this is uh, marketing. And then manipulating the science and tearing out that base of evidence so prominent with secondhand smoke. My friend Tom Burke and I wrote this paper quite a while ago about all the tactics used by the industry to attack the secondhand smoke evidence. This went on for probably two decades. Many of us participated in this. And what they did is they turned Epi-1 upside down. And everything that you do to make a study good, they said they didn't do what you need to do to make a study good. Arguments like, they can't control all the confounders. And one of the great arguments is the unknown confounder argument. There must be some factor that you're not controlling that you don't know about that's important. How can you argue against, uh, how can you argue against that? And then, of course, uh, the federal case uh, with Judge Kessler uh, finding the industry guilty under the racketeering standard a case where I was had the easy job of explaining to Judge Kessler what we knew about the adverse effects of active and passive uh, smoking. So this, I think, if you haven't read the Kessler opinion, 1,700 pages long, you sh if you want a readable account of the story of the industry, go find it. It's actually quite readable. It's a remarkable piece of work, but I love this prose. Tobacco industries market and sold their lethal product with zeal, with deception, with a single-minded focus on their financial success, and without regard for the human tragedy or social costs that success exacted. Imagine that tobacco executive going home. What'd you do today, Daddy? Think about it. So 
Back to this, I think it's useful then. The tobacco industry controlled the agent. It is the vector, and it controlled the uh, environment. This also turns out to be useful to think about how we intervene. We educate. We propose cessation. We try and change the environment with education. We litigate. We regulate. Again, litigation has proved successful in some contexts against the industry. And now, through FDA and other approaches, we regulate tobacco. So good old Epi 1 stuff is, uh, is useful. So I'm going to move on and uh, talk a little bit about the global tobacco epidemic. Some of you have seen this figure, first published about 30 years ago by uh, Alan Lopez, Richard Pito, and Michael Toon, a portrayal, a schema of sort of the stages of the tobacco epidemic. What you might think of is the United States going up and coming down, other countries lagging, and some just getting started. And I think it's a useful formulation and one I'm going to uh, come back to. So we're going to start with the pandemic past. And this is a figure out of the 2014 uh, anniversary uh, report. Just to do it justice, the full report is about 1,000 pages. Joanna only held up the 500 pages of figures and tables. And if you're a completionist, there's a web supplement. Uh, my wife is here. This took four years of my life and occupied a room of our house during those four years that was carefully arranged, seemingly haphazard piles that I was constantly under threat that she would touch them. Uh, but I was able to uh, stave, that, uh, stave that off. But this is useful. If you don't know this, go look at it because what it does is this is per capita cigarette consumption per eight person 18 years and older. At its peak, this is 200 packs per year per adult, whether smoker or non-smoker, 4,000 cigarettes a year. And not too many folks in this room were around in 1960, but we use the expression chain smoker. I used to see patients who smoked two or three packs of cigarettes a day lighting their next cigarette from the one that was going out. That's, at three packs a day, that's 600 minutes of burn time, 10 hours, which would be hard to do in a world where you can't smoke in your office, can't smoke in restaurants, can't smoke in uh, airplanes. So lots of things led that to go down. And we're going to talk a little bit about how this happened. We've talked about that in a way, mass marketing of cigarettes. If you've got sharp eyes, you see the rise in consumption with World War I men, World War II, particularly women. Uh, and here's those wars that drove things up. 1953, a meeting at the Plaza Hotel in New York of the tobacco industry's lawyers, along with the advertising firm of Hill and Knowlton, and the start of the campaign of fraud that led to the guilty verdict under RICO, under the racketeering standard. Now well documented, this is out of the files, December 28, 1953. So from there, the curve begins to bend finally. 64 Surgeon General's report, a brief drop in smoking, a rise again as there was sort of counters to the uh, report. But there were eras here, non-smokers' rights and clean indoor air being critical. An important paper, 1981, Hirayama in Japan following a cohort of women, finding increased risk for lung cancer in non-smoking women, listen carefully, non-smoking women married to smokers versus non-smoking women married to non-smokers. And that risk, the first paper of the series on lung cancer and passive uh, smoking. The 1986 Surgeon General's Report, I was one of the 
editors of this, this is Surgeon General Coop, a powerful voice on smoking. He uh, had had neck surgery at the time the report was uh, released, but here he is. The first conclusion, involuntary smoking is a cause of disease, including lung cancer in healthy non-smokers. That conclusion alone was powerful and fueled the ability of non-smokers to say, I don't want to go to a workplace where I'm exposed to a carcinogen. So that uh, report and later reports was uh, critical. The uh, a hearing on, uh, uh, famous hearing on uh, nicotine, uh, of course, I'm sorry, this is the hearing on air, aircraft, uh, 1987 on in-flight smoking ban. Again, I testified there and people said it would not be possible for there to be an in-flight smoking ban. People would never obey. And what happens if you smoke on an airplane? Uh, the police are waiting for you when you land. Okay, so a big change there. Uh, the Flight Attendants Medical Research Institute, the flight attendants had a key role in saying we don't want to work in a contaminated, dangerous workplace. Greater cessation with the arrival of nicotine replacement therapy and people wanting to quit. By the 70s and 80s, there was no doubt, I think, in the public's mind that smoking caused disease. Everybody knew somebody who had been killed by their cigarettes. So there was no doubt. And then we have Nicorette uh, arriving. We have cessation increasing. Now there are more people who have quit than people who are currently smoking. And sadly, we see more lung cancer in people who used to smoke, thought they had put aside those risks, which last, versus those who continued to smoke. And then the era of litigation, and again, the first case in which there was an actual settlement, the Chipolone case, very complex, Rose Chipolone, a uh, smoker with lung cancer suit, uh, launched uh, and continued by her spouse. The flight attendance uh, case handled by Stanley and Susan Rosenblatt in Florida that led to a settlement to the formation of the Flight Attendant Medical Research Institute. And I think Hopkins still, you still have a, no, did have a center here funded by uh, by uh, FAMRI. Uh, and then the Engle cases in Florida, the class action uh, case. And uh, then most important, the state cases. And the state cases were about costs paid for health care that were attributable to smoking. Okay, so Mississippi and then other states sued. And this led in the end to the settlement, the so-called Master Settlement Agreement that brought money to the states, a fair proportion of which was supposed to go to tobacco control that did not. Okay, and again, I, I will say in terms of uh, Hopkins, we worked actively with Minnesota to estimate the health costs for the state, a team from here, Scott Zeger, myself, some others, and then we worked on the uh, Department of Justice case around the same issues. In Minnesota, there was a $7 billion settlement with uh, the state and Blue Cross Blue Shield of uh, Minnesota. This is a case I worked on for four years. Uh, and then uh, the uh, RICO case, uh, of course, and that, again, was, I think, an important landmark because it codified, captured what the industry was, uh, had been doing. And then uh, regulation. Uh, we now have the Framework uh, Convention on Tobacco Control. That in itself is not regulatory, but it's the first WHO public health treaty that supports a wide range of uh, activities that we'll come back to. The Center for Tobacco Products, where Ben Appleberg works, created with the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, passed in 2009 under President uh, Obama giving uh, a wide range of authorities to uh, FDA. Uh, FDA uh, originally did not have authority over vaping products because basically they did not exist when the act was passed. Through this lengthy deeming process, they do now have jurisdiction over those. 
So that's the past. Now the present. Uh, so where, where are we? Well, people smoke around the world. I think most troubling is the fact that youth continue to smoke in the face of all that we know. And there are, of course, complex reasons why youth, young people, smoke, uh, and they do. And again, just a heat map uh, from the Tobacco Atlas. This is data compiled by uh, CDC through something called the Global Tobacco Surveillance System. And you know, here we are sort of lighting up pink. For some reason, Chile and Argentina, smoking remains uh, very high. You can see um, Russia. Uh, and parts of uh, Central and Eastern uh, Europe on the higher side. I think disturbing, and this is from a recent paper, is the level of addiction in those young people who smoke. And this is a paper looking at what percent of those who smoke youth uh, have indications of addiction. And just to wander around the world for a moment, you can just see this is the percent of users in different WHO regions who use tobacco and meet indications of being addicted to nicotine. So a third in Africa, the Americas. Again, you can see where these numbers sit. Eastern Mediterranean. If you've got sharp eyes in some places, the boys are ahead of the girls is Europe. Uh, Southeast Asia, again, you can see that uh, pattern. So, what we're worried, what I worry about when I see this is we have the next generation primed and ready to go. So tobacco epidemic present, unfortunately, will generate those who are to come in the future. And then uh, adults, again, things are continuing to go down. In the US, I think we're down to probably 17% or so, 18% current smokers in some states. We're going below 10 percent, uh, so we've made uh, we've made progress. But part of our problem here, tobacco present, and I've talked about this before. The agent keeps changing. It's complicating our understanding of risks. Certainly complicating our ability to do research because the marketplace changes so quickly. So these are some of our uh, old products, and there mostly people smoke cigarettes. All cigarettes are roughly the same. They have a gram of tobacco. They're produced by the same mass-producing machines around the, uh, around the world. People smoke, and they get tobacco-related disease. Now we have a huge range of products that deliver nicotine, which is what people are after. And just to look at this evolving marketplace, it's gotten really complicated. And there are so many ways, and the products are changing so quickly, that what the risks are and where they're going, we're unsure. And I think particularly for what this means for the youth who are being exposed to nicotine at a very young age. ICOS is the uh, heat not burn product from Altria Philip Morse uh, International. And we'll see more of these uh, for sure. Nicotine pouches, gums, lozenges. So lots of ways to get nicotine. Just walk into a convenience store and look at what's behind the counter. So there are all these new tobacco agents. One of the current, quote, debates, I don't like that word, is about the role of these products in harm reduction. So here's my take on this story. I had a paper with my uh, USC colleague, Jessica Barrington Trimis, in the American Journal of public health a few years ago where we wrote a counter to a paper from the past presidents of the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco, who used to be my friends. Uh, but here's the crux of our story. So who benefits from harm reduction, say, using vaping products? So I will not argue with anyone who says that if the comparison for toxicity is the combusted cigarette, another electronic vaping device, those conventionally available, are lower risk. There's less stuff that's bad that's coming out of them, put simply. 
And for, say, a 60-year-old who's moving towards having COPD, to switch makes sense. OK, so there's some benefits. Harms. So for adults, maybe there's less cessation, or people get back on nicotine, and then they say, yeah, nicotine's great, but I've got to go back to smoking. They get re-cued by having this. We renormalize nicotine. But to me, the un biggest unknown is our use. And we know that they use these products. We had this incredible epidemic of use of Juul that you know about about four or five years ago. Really caught everybody by surprise. I first learned about Juul by talking to the mother of a 14-year-old who said, do you know about Juul? And I said, no, because our surveillance systems have a couple of year lag built in. So uh, maybe we need to be talking to the parents, the school teachers, and so on to figure out what kids are using. But looking at this, how do you weigh the harms and benefits? So who's a parent here? So do you want your children to be nicotine exposed, potentially, so that your 60-year-old neighbor is safer from his or her smoking? Put on your parent hat, the answer is no right? You don't want to take that risk. And if you are the 60-year-old smoker, you're concerned about your health and not the broader societal impact. And we have trials of these products for cessation, but they're not about what happens if you can buy them in any convenience store and if they're widely available. That we can only look at at the population level, and we haven't done that well. So that was the point that uh, Jessica and I made in this paper. The other thing, of course, we have now is the Framework uh, Convention. And the Institute, of course, is very involved with the implementation of the framework uh, in its uh, Bloomberg uh, activities. One thing, the Empower Program, which is uh, this package of activities proposed by WHO supported by Bloomberg, monitoring, uh, protecting, offering uh, cessation, raising tactics, uh, taxes, and enforcing. Their, their uh, adherence to those measures has gone up, but it's far from uh, complete. And if we look uh, worldwide, this is the percent of nations with at least two uh, of these modalities in place. We have a long way uh, to go still to get all six in place. And this is just a map of what has happened. We've done well with monitoring that's been supported by uh, Bloomberg and others. Smoke-free environments have increased, but we have a ways to go. So let's move on to pandemic future. Okay, so here back to our schematic diagram. And I think there's a couple of key messages here. In these countries, we want to continue that downward trend and accelerate it. And most importantly, in those early countries, we want to make sure that they're not the next marketplace. We want to assure that tobacco industry efforts to enter these marketplaces using tactics that we know about are not uh, successful. And uh, again, Sub-Saharan Africa, where I'm often now for work on uh, air pollution and uh, climate stress, very few people smoke. It needs to stay that way. Who needs to add tobacco to the uh, public health threats in that part of the uh, world? So lots to do. So what may make a difference in the future? Well, the industry is not going away. I have not heard one of the multinational companies say, time to go out of business, OK? And we know that the products are going to continue to proliferate, upping our challenge of tracking. FCTC is going to remain the framework. Social media will be a threat. I, at, at USC, we had a very good group doing uh, tobacco control uh, research. And I spent an evening talking to one of my postdocs 10, 12 years ago, 
who was explaining social media to me, a Neanderthal, and uh, bots, and all the fake bot traffic about tobacco and who was generating it. And I was just sort of incredulous that this was going on. And of course, this remains still a major issue, not only for tobacco, but with other um, products. And then our problem of now, of misinformation, disinformation, just getting worse. Unknowns, the sustainability of the global tobacco control movement, which I think we're all worried about because we're well launched. And who will sustain things five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Will governments invest? Uh, a critical question. What is the role of litigation? Some going on globally. This harm reduction story, which I talked about. In-game strategies, which I'll come to. And what uh, the FDA is going to do with implications nationally and potentially internationally if important strategies come, uh, come out. About 20 years ago, I think people started talking about the end game, the end game in tobacco, which is gonna be where we have very few people smoking. And there were a lot of meetings about the end game. I think this is before the arrival of all the vaping products and things looked a little bit different. But uh, some of the strategies, there was a paper published in 1994 proposing reduction of nicotine in cigarettes, withdrawing the population essentially from nicotine collectively. Uh, this is a strategy that was voiced, I think, originally by FDA perhaps five years ago. And now in 2022, again, there's an announcement of uh, exploration of this strategy. Under the Tobacco Control Act, FDA can reduce nicotine in cigarettes just not to zero. The idea of tobacco-free generations, New Zealand, uh, for example. And then we have a lot of room to gain with the framework convention and empower. And again, the Conference of the Parties continues to take on all the opportunities and challenges um, that uh, are there with the FCTC. I'll just mention, and this is something the Institute is working on, the externalities of the industry, tobacco waste. And if you look at the cycle of products going from agriculture to disposal, there's an awful lot of externalities here, health costs being one, of course, waste uh, being uh, another. An externality is just that. It's something that's generated by, in this case, the tobacco industry, but they don't have to pay for it. Okay, so uh, there it is. And one of those externalities, and I'm gonna move to this quickly to leave time for question, is the tobacco waste. Tobacco filters are made of cellulose acetate, plastic, non-biodegradable. Trillions of them, of course, uh, thrown away into our, uh, into our uh, eco, uh, ecosystems, uh, washing up everywhere. And I'm just gonna wander through here. We have this emerging problem of microplastics with cigarette filters being uh, fairly substantial contributors. A little frightening, this stuff is in all of us now uh, and its toxicity is being um, examined. Its ubiquity is uh, concerning. Uh, E-waste, clearly a problem with all the electronic uh, products uh, as well. So last post-truth, our post-truth world, misinformation, disinformation, the ability to rapidly uh, disseminating it. And this blankets public health. Okay, everybody knows what we went through with COVID and people just make stuff up. And uh, it's really unfortunate. So I worry about that uh, as we come to uh, the tobacco epidemic and the ability of misinformation to spread uh, so uh, quickly. When in doubt, quote the big Lebowski. So I'm gonna end here. Uh, I haven't been bold in my predictions. I've gotten wiser uh, about that. About 20 years ago, I actually, somebody said to me, I'm thinking about going into global tobacco control. I would have said, don't do that. And now if somebody said to me, came to me and said, 
I'm thinking about going into global tobacco control, sadly, I would probably say you're going to have a job for a long time. So we'll see. Joanne is shaking her head uh, with sadness. But uh, this may be, uh, may be reality. So again, uh, thanks so much for the invitation. I look forward to having a conversation about this. At the end, you were talking a lot about the future. And I'm just curious if you've given any thought to the potential impact of artificial intelligence and a lot of these new tools that are coming out online and how the industry might use them and how that might change the playbook for them and for tobacco control folks? Well, the easy answer is no. Uh, I, you know, I recently sort of gave a talk about the future of epidemiology and talked about the role of uh, artificial intelligence. I guess the concern would be, which is maybe what you're getting at, is could marketing messages be ever more refined and targeted, which I, I think would be a concern because that's, of course, the ability to process lots of information, sometimes about me or you, uh, which uh, would be uh, concerning. So uh, good point and maybe something you can work on for the next 30 years. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It's crazy to see how far you guys have been able to take it um, with your work. But I'm very interested in uh, gun control and violence prevention with gun control. And I'm curious if you have any, I guess, advice for having been able to be so successful in your work of creating controls for tobacco, where in the US it's very hard to restrict access to guns, but sometimes I feel like they're a little bit parallel. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question, and I almost would bounce it back to you, not being cowardly, but for your, for your thoughts. I mean, I, you know, we have an engine violence prevention center in Colorado and are working very hard. I mean, there's, there are some parallels around this interplay of politics, which, of course, is so prominent, and the tobacco industry, but, I, you know, we... In tobacco, the industry infiltrated and was powerful. And I think only in the end with some of the very public outings, if you will, of what the industry was up to, tobacco industry, that is. You know, the, I mean, in a way, the gun industry and the NRA are outed, but they're still at it, aren't they? So, I mean, that peril sort of breaks down. And the litigation, again, which was a powerful and useful tool in part for tobacco. It had some downsides to goddess the tobacco industry documents, which have been critical. So whether there's, I'm sure your, you, your colleagues are looking at litigation. I mean, I know that's certainly part of what Hopkins does here. And um, again, perhaps there's some parallels, but I, I, I think they're somewhat different. And going back to the epidemiological triangle. I mean, the tobacco industry is somewhat unique in its ability to manipulate that whole um, arrangement. So great question, very thought provoking. And I'll, I'll stop there. I hope we, we're going to go to one question online. And this might have to be the last question, um, but we, even though we have many online. Um, can harm reduction ever be done by the same companies who sell cigarettes? <laughs> Well, I, you know, I mean, of course, uh, the industry would argue that, in fact, they are offering harm reduction products. And ICOS, I think, would be uh, the example that does have a, uh, that I'm looking at you, it's modified exposure uh, indication that they were able to obtain through the FDA process. Um, if the goal is to maintain enough nicotine addicted people to make a profit. And you can do that by selling something other than combustible cigarettes. I'm sure they are all exploring those, um, those avenues because they are, you know, if you will, in the nicotine uh, business and not necessarily the tobacco smoke uh, business. In fact, the Philip Morris, uh, Philip Morris, of course, had its uh, international, had its foundation for a smoke-free 
world. My comment about that was it was not the foundation for a nicotine-free uh, world. So it's a, it's a good question, and I think, uh, in fact, the industry is exactly going down um, that, uh, that path. I think we're going to have to end it there. Um, I do want to acknowledge one of the things I'm very proud of is that you just mentioned the Foundation for Smoke-Free World. So our dean led an initiative to get um, deans of other schools of public health to pledge not to take money uh, from the Foundation for Smoke-Free World. You're one of the signatories. Thanks so much. But that, I think that's, these are, that's an example of how our school shows leadership in this country and globally. So, John, I just want to thank you for an amazing 25th anniversary lecture, um, looking back at tobacco control, and a few thoughts on uh, looking forward as well. We are so honored to have you here sharing your insights. And I just wanted to thank you for your foresight in establishing the Institute for Global Tobacco Control, which has continued to make important contributions to inform tobacco control policy globally. And I also want to acknowledge all that you, you have done personally to rid the world of tobacco caused death, disease, and suffering. So thank you. Thank you. And um, for uh, everyone else, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, it's Global Tobacco Control. And we have videos on our studies and our, our lecture series. So this lecture will be posted next week, I believe. Uh, and you can also join our mailing list and everything else. So thank you so much for joining today and thank you so much, thank you. John. See you at the 50th.